Welcome to The Visible Artist. My name is Sophie Loxton Lucas, and I am so excited to bring you this extra special episode this week. As many of you know, I have worked at the Other Art Fair for many years, so it was great fun to sit down with Ryan and just talk about the fair, reminisce, and talk about some of our highlight artists, but also chat about why the fair is so important and what makes it so special. This was more of an informal chat, so I really hope you enjoy this episode. Hi everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Visible Artist. I am sitting here in the home of Ryan Stania, And for most of our listeners, Ryan needs no introduction. Many of you have probably spoken to him on site at the Other Art Fair, the incredible fair he founded 10 years ago. The Other Art Fair is a leading artist fair with additions in LA, Brooklyn, Chicago, Dallas, London, Sydney and Melbourne. At each fair, 130 artists independently take a booth and are free to hang, curate, price and sell their work to an audience of buyers. Over the past decade, the fair has served as an incredible platform for the creative community. It has enabled thousands of artists to sell their work without having to rely on the gallery system. Many can now work as full-time professional artists. Many have used the international editions of the fair to take their work to new markets and audiences. And Ryan has led the fair from the very beginning. He had a clear vision of creating an environment to connect existing, emerging artists with first-time buyers and much more established collectors. There is so much content online, videos and photos about the fair, so definitely check it out if you're interested. And there's also plenty of interviews with Ryan about the fair, how it sits with the art world, what makes it the other, how to apply. So today I'm going to really focus on the behind the scenes details. I'm going to talk to Ryan about his approach and experiences in creating this amazing platform. And at this point, I should mention that I am, of course, very familiar with the fair. I've worked at the other art fair for many, many years, and I've seen it grow from a local London edition to launching in Australia and the US, being acquired by an LA media company and selling over one million pounds worth of artworks. So it's been an incredible journey to watch, and I'm excited to chat to Ryan today. Hi, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Hi, Sophie. Uh, (laughs) That's a really nice introduction. Thanks for that. Yeah, I feel like I should reciprocate in some way because <laughs> largely most of it is down to I would always say, you know, your your hard work and your vision as well and your sort of involvement in it. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be anywhere near where we are now today if it wasn't for you. So, you know, thanks for all your hard work on it. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. That's so nice. I mean, I hadn't planned to start here, but the team that you have with the fair and everyone that works on site and all the artists, it really feels so people are genuinely passionate about the fair and that's what comes across when visitors walk through the doors and artists meet our team for the first time. Yeah, Um, I think, I mean, that's definitely something I hear quite a lot, both from artists and from visitors. I think it's just that unique atmosphere, isn't it? And I think that does start from always like having like-minded people in the office and a like-minded team and just people that first of all really, you know, they really care. Um, I was actually going to swear that. <laughs> Are we allowed to swear on this? Um, no, it's but, you it's know, got the, a safe, re- safe marking, so no. <laughs> but they really care. You know, we really care about the artists and how well they're going to do from the fair. And, you know, we, we really listen to what their needs are and um, the reason why they're doing it, what their objectives are. And then to personally give, you know, advice and work with artists to, you know, try and get the best outcome from, you know, what essentially is an art fair, but... I don't think we've ever really viewed it only as a fair. I think we've always thought about it as, you know, not just four days of selling a booth to an artist and then off they go when visitors walk through the door. We do workshops in the lead to, lead up to the event. Obviously, there's a lot of like personal one-to-ones with artists. And then now, obviously, working with Sachi Art, it means we've got online profiles. We've got pretty savvy with our data so we can retarget. Uh, a lot of the buyers that come through the door over the weekends, wherever that may, may be, whether it's in Sydney or you know New York or London or any other of these you know wonderful places. So yeah, I think that's due to the success. I think some of the things you've just said are words and phrases that maybe other like big companies might use, but they they might even call, you might say they're empty words. But actually, it really is genuine when it comes to the fair. Mm. Every one of the team loves working with our artists they've got favorite artists that they've chosen out of the fair that their work particularly speaks to them and so when we all come together on site there's a really exciting atmosphere yeah there really is and it feels like we're working with the artists Mm. I mean of course it's a business and you know we have a business model and that sort of thing 
But I think it, more than that, it's like we personally really care about each of the artists. And like you say, of course, naturally, because we're human beings, we can have our favourites, um, our favourite artworks. But yeah, everyone really, really cares. And I think everyone, you know, and also as a team, we all really get on really well. You know, we travel a lot together. We're often in, in the office, obviously a lot less at the moment. But we really care for each other as well, you know? We, and I think that's a really important thing. So if you're spending so much time together with people, then you know, it's important that you all get on. Yes, I think it's quite amazing <laughs> that we do get on so well, considering <laughs> how intense it can be on site, working up to the fair and then getting it all ready quite a short space of time. Often our time frames on site are quite, quite tight. I think people are often surprised by that. I mean, there are moments. <laughs> It's not, it's, not, it's not all as sunny as it looks. Well, I was going to ask. moments where we've been, <laughs> me included, there's been a few tears. Well, I was going to ask you about that, but that was going to be later on in the conversation. <laughs> I feel like we've really jumped in. I was going to say that when I look back at all the editions of the fair, there were so many memories that really make me laugh. And I was wondering if there are any for you in that way. Yeah, oh, in terms of making me laugh, um, laugh and cry, I guess, at the same time. I mean, one... <laughs> One that sort of often comes up in my mind is, I think it was 2013, we were building the fair at Ambika P3 in London, and we had the stand builders, so we had this contractor company that come in, they build all the walls, their role is to paint them, put the signage up and put the lighting up, and it usually takes a whole day. Anyway, they've come in, built all of the walling, and it was an overnight build, so about midnight, I sort of ordered some pizzas to keep the morale up and keep everyone's energy levels high. <laughs> We went down into the office. We gave the pizzas to all the staff. We came out 10 minutes later and they'd all disappeared. So they built the fair. So all the hard walls are up, but there's no signage. And there's no, like, and we had, what was it, 120 artist booths to paint white because they weren't white. Um, so obviously being midnight and all the artists coming at nine o'clock in the morning after obviously sh shedding a few tears, <laughs> um, I had that moment where it was like, Right, what do we do? Right, there's about three or four of us on site. We all called a few friends. People turned up and they really helped us. And we sort of ended up painting that fair till like four or five o'clock in the morning. Had two hours sleep, then back ready for the artist to arrive at nine o'clock. So, I mean, there's a lot, and there's quite a few examples of things like that. So, on the face of it, when people walk through the door, it looks like quite a polished event in many ways. But often there's a lot that goes into sort of making that happen. Well, you can laugh about it now, but at that moment, you must have been feeling pretty panicked. I mean, you have the weight of all these artists coming in in the morning. They've obviously paid for their booth. It's a huge opportunity for them. They've been preparing for it for months. So how do you manage that side of things? Again, it goes back to sort of staff and having people around you that you trust. And, you know, people that have that same level of sort of vested enthusiasm into, into it. So when a moment like that does occur... And they're always going to occur. I mean, it's the nature of events, mm. right? There's, you've always got to expect the unexpected. So it's about having people around you that when something like that does happen, you know, everyone pulls together. I mean, it happened in Brooklyn. A similar scenario yes. happened in Brooklyn <laughs> only a year ago. So that's now then almost 10 years into doing the fair. So, you know, it's just having people around you that are all willing to sort of get stuck in. And you know, it doesn't matter what job you've got within the fair it's like at that point we're all you know pulling in together and having a laugh and putting a bin bag all over our clothes in order to sort of paint a booth and you've done that many times <laughs> yes I, have. <laughs> I think in some ways we're a victim of our own success because now the expectations on the fair are so high from the artists I mean we work with amazing stand builders the fair looks so beautiful and particularly I'm thinking of the Brooklyn fair because we have that all that light mm. and high stands and the artists are bringing in really exciting, fantastic work. So we have to deliver an amazing fair for them. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like the artists are upping their game, if you like, which then puts pressure on us to up our game. And we're constantly looking for new suppliers and, you know, better stands and better lighting and thinking about new marketing campaigns and evolving because marketing changed so much over that sort of 10 year period you know, constantly thinking about new ways in which we can elevate what we're doing. And all of it is around shining a light on the artists that are going to be showing at the fair. So, you know, they work hand in hand in terms of like the artists 
I guess, challenging what they're doing on their booth and then for us to then sort of respond to that. That's definitely been one of the highlights I found working on the fair for so long is seeing how artists have developed and how they have used the fair to push themselves. Mm. And they come on site and have an amazing new showcase of work or they do a really adventurous hang. And it's really exciting to see that they take the chance on the fair. They use that opportunity, not in yeah. the safest way, you might say. Yeah, certainly. And yeah, like, you know, like I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, like we always, as a team, we always sit behind, you know, go into the organizer's office and sort of chat about certain booths and people that have really sort of pushed the boundaries. And it gets us really excited. But as I'm sitting here reminiscing, thinking about being on site at a fair, which hasn't been for a couple of months now, which kind of feels strange. There's also the other side to that of like artists that don't really go out and they may be underestimated what they're taking on or I don't know. I don't know what the situations are, but I find it personally, even now, personally so heartbreaking when an artist doesn't, because of course, you know, the fair isn't going to work all the time for everyone. It just can't. I mean, no event ever does. But for the one or two artists that it doesn't work for, I know that you and I think everyone feels really, well, me certainly personally, really, uh, I find it so heartbreaking. I find it so difficult to deal with. But I mean, I don't know how to change that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you are very, very present on site. So you would, if you saw that happening, go over and talk to the artists about right. their booth, wouldn't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think that's a really important side of the fair as well, that you, I mean, you're the founder, you started 10 years ago, but you're still now on site often welcoming people at the front desk or helping yeah. artists hang their work. Do you enjoy all that side of it still? That's the bit I like the most. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's nothing like a big queue around the bar on the opening night and then the bar staff being overwhelmed and then having to go out the back and then start pouring drinks and getting them out on trays. You know, it's all part and parcel of running events. It does look glamorous at times, but then at other times, you know, you don't see that side of things and but again, it's the camaraderie of just making it all happen as good as it can be. I mm -hmm. think that's what we're always striving for. It's like, it doesn't matter what's happening and what we're all doing individually. It's like on the face of it, are, are the artists getting good value for being there? And are the visitors having a good time? And they're having such a good time that they're willing to, you know, part with some cash and actually and find an artist that they really like and connect with and then an artwork that they buy. Yeah, it's kind of to piece all that together. I think sometimes artists can get distracted by all the small details, but essentially our audience is coming on site to have a good time and buy from artists. So it's important not to lose sight of that. And you always say, if we have a good opening night, a good Thursday night, yeah. the rest of the fair will flow and it will be a success. Yeah. I mean, I know I used to say that. I've sort of, <laughs> I, might, I might have to change my mind on that because I've been proven wrong so many times. On it. I think it's good to We've think We've always have. Way. No, no, certainly we always have a big opening night. And yeah. thankfully, touch wood, I'm touching all the wood I can find, um, that that's always happened and people have turned up. And, you know, we've always had big opening nights. I can't actually think of a, you know, an, an opening that we haven't been like that. And it seems to keep growing remarkably. I mean, in Brooklyn just a couple of weeks ago, and obviously we couldn't get there, but there was queues around. I think the queue almost went twice around the building, which is kind of crazy to think that we only started there like four or five years ago. And at that point, like nobody had heard of us and artists were like, oh, do I, you know, show at this fair? And now there's just such enthusiasm from local people that want to come and, you know, they're having a great time when they're there. I think that's the one thing I've tried to do is make an event because I think where it comes from is I love going to art events, mm. but I don't always have a good time. Yes. So I always yeah. walk away feeling a bit like while I'm there, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. Even now I go to many exhibitions and I feel a bit uncomfortable and I just don't ever want anyone to walk through the door and feel like that. It should be a celebration of art and the artist should be celebrated. And when people come through the door, they should be able to sort of express themselves and whether that's from sticking their arm through a hole and getting a tattoo or taking their clothes off and getting drawn <laughs> all of these things have happened in the past that's what art should be about it's just more of the enjoyment factor i mean you, you see all the other industries like in like in music how how much do people enjoy interacting with music you go to a gig and it's a celebration everyone's mm. really enjoying themselves and the same with other industries, but like, like any even sport events or anything like that, it's a big celebration of whatever you're passionate about. Whereas I don't always feel like 
art offers that, art events offer that. Whereas I think we've gone quite a long way in trying to provide that. It's strange that because if you were being straightforward, you'd say these art galleries are there to sell work. So they need to create an atmosphere where people will buy work and making it stuffy and intimidating is, it seems obvious that that's not the way to go about it, but. It was the old way of going about it. Yes. I don't know how long that will exist for. Mm. It does feel quite old fashioned when you think about it. Yes. Yeah, it really does. I mean, there's a real call for transparency within the art world and being inclusive about who comes to your space and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. But I suppose going back to the fair, we also, yes, it is a fun, lively, environment but we also do need to sell work yeah we've got 130 artists that need to sell work it's a it's a challenge yeah no certainly and we don't lose focus of that but i know that if we create that atmosphere then people feel comfortable within that space and then they buy and i've seen the other side of that where and i've seen so many fairs or exhibitions where there's a level of expectation from the artist who's showing but then the organiser just doesn't deliver. I mean, you could have a room full of people, but if you're not creating, and it's such a fine-tuning moment. And I know that, you know, you and I walk around a fair and it's like, is the music slightly too loud or is it slightly not loud enough? Or is the queue too long around? It's just these little fine-tuning things that you, I guess it's just experience that you sort of work out, but they make such a difference. It's not just about opening the doors and people flooding in and then people buy art, I think. Yes, definitely. And I think the artists respond to that as well. You can tell when they're having a great time on site. And I know in the past we've had some quite unusual performances, but that I've seen artists that I might not expect to really respond well to those performances. It's amazing. I love it. Yeah. Um, It's really exciting thinking about the US fairs because, as you say, it was a brand new market and we didn't really have any connections with the Brooklyn or the New York scene. We just took the fair there and now we have hundreds of people in the neighborhood who are all desperate to come along. And when I speak to new partners, they've often heard about the fair and they love the fair. They bought work from the fair. We have. Oh, It's just amazing that Mm. you can create that. When you started, did you have that sort of vision for the fair when you start launched the first London fair with 80 artists on the, on yeah. the South Bank? I always had a vision of where I wanted to get it to. And I guess I never, <laughs> I guess this is a slightly broader way I'd answer this question, is that I say this because I, I mean, I recently did a talk at Kingston University and, right, and it's very focused on business. Now... And I guess it's sort of like, it's a little bit overlaid with a sort of spiritual sort of understanding around the world as well, at least my my understanding, which is essentially I had this like vision and I sort of always knew that it was going to get there. So it wasn't like I was aspiring to and I was driven by any business ambition, if you like. Mm. It's like I just was so confident around the idea that I knew that as long as I was doing day-to-day, I was doing the right things and putting the right things in place, I knew we'd always get there. So even like going into somewhere like Brooklyn, where you don't know anyone, it's like this is a format that's worked really well for artists in London. So there's no reason why it can't be translated into Brooklyn or Sydney or LA or Chicago, all where they've got real thriving artist communities, many of which the artists, you know, have the the same issues of trying to get into galleries and it's a closed door situation. So being able to sort of create that space where artists can freely come and show their work and many people that aren't in the art world and are interested in buying art, which is probably a far greater population of people, you know, opening the doors and saying, look, you're welcome here. Come in. doesn't matter where you're from or how much money you've got. Come in and enjoy, you know, this great event. And over a very short period of time, it sort of became very popular. You know, Mm -hmm. the word gets out and it's like, and it's, and I think largely because we don't have huge marketing budgets, but so much of it is word of mouth. Yeah. So people come along to, you know, they say that if you have, I think (laughs) actually it's the other way around. So if you have a good experience, I think you end up telling nine people, but if you have a bad experience, you end up telling 19, I think it is. (laughs) So it's important to do, you know, create a good experience to people. And then soon the word does get out. And it's the same with the artist community. If the artists have exactly. a good time on site, they'll tell everyone. But if they have a bad time on site, they'll, exactly. they'll, <laughs> they'll exactly. write about it on every Facebook group. Exactly. 
And look, we've never lost focus to that. That's always been our number one thing. And we always go back to that every time. Mm -hmm. Even at the moment, we're going through a rebrand. And this is like on the face of it. This is just like changing the face of, of, you know, the look of our fair or look of our logo and our branding and that sort of thing. Now, how does that directly relate to artists? I mean, you could argue that it doesn't really, but it's still in our minds. We're like, does this reflect the event that's, you know, going to be showcasing these artists? And are artists going to be, are artists going to like the branding? Mm. Do they want to be associated to something that looks like this? It's always the focus of our attention. Well, let's talk more about the artists. And I'd like to know more about the artists that you that started with the fair. Because I know that there are some artists that it's really changed their lives over the last 10 years. But yeah. could you tell us about the artists that you started with and if there are any highlights? Yeah, I'm glad you didn't say your favourite artists. Cause yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess there's one that sort of immediately comes to mind. His name is Dan Hillier. Mm. We all know Dan Hillier here in London. Um, now, before I started the other art fair, I had a few artist friends, Dan being one, of which were in a situation where they wanted, they, you know, they wanted to get their work out there. At the time, Dan was actually selling his work on a market store in Spitalfields Market. And they weren't necessarily that interested in working with galleries, but open to it perhaps. Um, but essentially, he just wanted to get his work in front of people, in front of an audience. Anyway, so my first working with Dan was I, I somehow rented this like little pop-up. It was, I think it was an older ice cream shop at the time in Covent Garden and I basically just put up his work on the wall and we just started selling it and he was there and I was there and you know we were sort of doing this like little pop-up gallery space for a while and then after a period I sort of realized I didn't want to be a gallerist or be in that space so we started the other art fair anyway Dan did the first I mean I'd probably say the first I don't know it was only up until three years ago that he stopped doing it so for the first seven years he did every single London fair and over that period of time, the number of artworks he was selling was growing quite considerably. The price of his work obviously was going up. He then got a show with Saatchi Gallery. I think that's where he got a little bit too big for us. <laughs> <laughs> but then he needed a sellout show there. So I think that's a really good example of an artist that sort of grew with the fair, using it as a platform to sort of like get out there. Um, came with absolutely no ego attached. And it was such a pleasure working with him. And I'm still very, very good friends with him. We only spoke yesterday as well. So I think that's, you know, a really good example. Another artist uh, that comes to mind is an artist, he's a photographer called Cody Choi. Oh, yes. Now, yeah. Cody, interestingly, was a, was a dancer. So I think he danced at the Royal Ballet. Um, and he was coming to the end of his career and he'd done a photography course. So he was a very good photographer and he started doing lots of amateur photography. Um, he came to the other art fair, and I only found out this story quite recently. He came to the other art fair, I think it would have been about five years ago, with what then was, I mean, I'm sure you'll be fine with me saying this, it was a date. He was on a date. So this girl <laughs> had brought him to the fair, thinking it was a romantic place to come, which I fully endorse. I think it's a very romantic place to come on a date. And he was just really inspired by it. He saw the artists sort of selling their work. He went away refined his practice a little bit more he applied for the fair got in now since then he's then gone on to be really uh, one of our big sellers he does very well he's done the london phase and the la fair i think he's done the new york fair he now has a presence with sachi art all the curators know him he's now a full-time artist and that's all the back all off the back of just coming along on a date i don't know whether the date lasted i don't know whether they're still together <laughs> Uh, be interested to know <laughs> yeah Cody if you're listening let <laughs> yeah, us know <laughs> let us know <laughs> that's an amazing story and a kind of the dream story that the fair enables people to have turn their passion for art into a full-time career yeah. and amazing for our buyers as well because we always talk about our artists but yeah actually there are so many buyers that now I think feel really personally connected to the fair and the experiences they have there and the conversations they have with artists because, of course, the works that they buy at the fair then go into their homes. It's so personal. From memory, we worked out recently how many artworks, individual artworks, that we've sold at the fair. And it worked out to be... This is just on site, so I'm sure there's lots of sales that happened afterwards. I think it was in the region just over 60,000 individual artworks in 10 years. 
So imagine all those artworks now in people's homes, which Mm. people are enjoying and they've all got a story attached because they chatted to the artist before buying it. Hopefully we're spreading a little bit of happiness as well. (laughs) (laughs) Well, looking around your home, I can see lots of artworks. like a journey through the other art fair over the years. (laughs) (laughs) You've got some guest artist prints, which I recognise, and then other personal pieces that you've chosen from fairs, all of the fairs, I think. You. Yeah. Have you got any particular favourites? Uh, I got to the point where I couldn't actually buy one, a piece at every single fair, but I think, <laughs> um, I mean, certainly most of them I'll buy at least a little piece. There's one that she's, I'm looking at at the moment by the front door, which is by an artist called Alison McKenna. And I've always been a massive fan of hers. And she did three or four fairs, I think, with us. A little abstract painting. It's interesting because she's the sort of artist where, and of course it's, you know, so um subjective but like it kind of goes a little bit unnoticed in my house but every now and again I'll get somebody that walks through the door and really connects to it and is like totally in love with it that's how I feel about it so Mm. I really enjoy that little painting in the main room also there's a really good um, figurative artist called Geraldine Swain Mm. I've got two she does these little miniature pieces so they're literally a couple of inches in size but they're really beautiful, just like some naked torsos. Mm. And you've got some of your own portraits as well, haven't you? I mean, not self-portraits, just portraits of I you. I thought you were asking me have... whether I did my own painting. <laughs> I actually people do have... have one of my own paintings in my bedroom, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the bedroom, so nobody actually gets to see it, which is intentional. So what was the question? Well, I was just, it makes me laugh that someone, I mean, very kindly someone oh, yeah. got in touch and painted your portrait without you even knowing. I That's think, true, yeah, and yeah. sent you the portrait. Yeah, they found me on Instagram. <laughs> and decided to do a beautiful painting of me, sent it to me in the post, and now it's proudly sitting in my living room. Mm, that's such a lovely <laughs> story. Yeah, it's a really, really eclectic mix. I guess that's a reflection of the fair as well, isn't it? This idea that there's something for everyone at the fair. So whether you're into photography or sculpture or paint, big paintings or small portraits, or you'd find it there, I think. Mm. So when you're walking around the fair, what sort of work might catch your eye? Or what sort of artist might you be, uh, might impress you? I guess those are two different questions. Yeah. The artwork that you are drawn to and then artists that you are impressed by. It's funny because I would say that because there is such an eclectic mix here, I would say that instinctively I'd say that I'm not really drawn to anything in particular. But then actually, I think it was only last week, I was sitting in my living room and I realised everything was black, white, or grey. Mm. So I'm obviously drawn to like, this sort of... Um, maybe it's something to do with me being uh, colourblind as well, which doesn't mean that I don't see colour. That's a common misconception. <laughs> People always freak out when you say that. I know. <laughs> but actually, if you look into what colour blindness is, it's not quite that. In basic terms, it means that when you're in the optician and they bring out that little chart and you can see a number on it, I basically can't see the chart, which means I can't be a train driver. Otherwise, what am I looking for from an artist on their booth? Generally, quite, I mean, I feel like I've said this a thousand times, but like Mm. consistency definitely in their work. I mean, just well presented. Even when you just frame an artwork well, you hang it well, you don't overhang. Just to simply present the work in its best possible light. And that doesn't necessarily mean spending a lot of money, much more money on really expensive materials or framing. It's just having a a style, isn't it? Yeah, and attention to detail. There's two types of artists that do the fair. There's those... By the way, I'd probably put myself... If I was an artist, I'd put myself in the first category. (laughs) And it sounds bad by saying more of a slapdash approach. So they come in, put all their artworks out on the floor, and then they hang them up, which is fine. It's fine. But then you do see the other artists that come in and they've printed out their stand plan. They know exactly where all the work's going to hang. They measure everything out meticulously. And you do see the difference. I mean, obviously, it depends on the style of the work and that sort of thing, and what, what aesthetic you're going for. But generally speaking, I, I'd say that I definitely see the difference. And I would recommend, obviously, planning your, your booth beforehand. Well, the fair now attracts buyers who are investing in the artworks so there needs to be a high level of professionalism with the artists presenting their work we need to know that the artists are going to be using i mean i know i mentioned not it doesn't have to be the most expensive but it does have to be good quality materials and they have to addition their prints properly and all that sort of thing i would also say that i've seen a massive difference over the last 10 years so i think at the very beginning it was and again it was an unknown for us as Art fair organisers were going in and, you know, the, and the walling at that point wasn't of the highest quality and the lighting wasn't. And artists weren't presenting their work necessarily that well and there's lots of 
things on the floor and it didn't feel as elevated as say as it does now and I, you know just going back to the point we were making earlier we're constantly looking to improve every aspect of the fair as a result of that now artists present their work so well i've walked around many gallery shows that don't look as good no i know absolutely not mentioning any <laughs> <laughs> What would you say to artists who may look at the fair and think my work is not commercial enough to do the fair? Get a second opinion. I fully respect any artist that does the fair, first of all, because it's so nerve-wracking to be standing in front of your work, having to talk to strangers about it, and then get to a point of selling. So if you know, you're first of all coming with all of that, and you're aware of that. And that's a lot to take on. Of course, yes, you can have helpers there or an assistant. But first of all, I think it's worth acknowledging that. Mm. So then yeah. just going back to like thinking about some work, is it commercial enough? Well, I mean, first of all, some might not be. And we might just have to accept that because the art fair definitely doesn't work for every single artist. We know that. And I definitely would be the first to say if I thought an artist wouldn't wasn't going to benefit from doing the fair then I wouldn't encourage them to do it for sure and we've done that we've had that conversation many times but I mean look being part of the fair yeah you might you'll probably sell I mean like 90% of our artists sell something at the fair but you'll definitely meet lots of contacts and lots of interesting contacts so you might not necessarily be the artist that's painting a picture for a living room but you might be doing something a little bit different maybe more conceptual which perhaps somebody walking around the fair is looking for and then they get the idea to commission you to do an installation within their office space or that sort of thing Mm -hmm. and there's quite a lot that of that that happens at the fair as well I suppose it ties into a bigger picture for that artist because if their work is not going to work at the other art fair then they probably need to look at different avenues anyway because it's the the fair is pretty um pretty broad yeah it's it's reach True. And I think as a team, we work with those sorts of artists. If they do want to show at the fair, we might find them a sound booth that works for them or even put them in a more prominent space. So, because yeah. we're excited that they, they're bringing that work. To definitely. The fair. Definitely. I think that's really important. We're not just looking for work that will be really popular. Yeah. It's, we are trying to showcase the other and emerging artists and the next big thing. Yeah. We? Yeah. 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 Totally. And our audience trusts us to do that. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> yes. I, was, well, I thought you might do this at one point. <laughs> <laughs> You're prepared for it. That's good. What artist sticks out in your mind of their story of, of their sort of involvement in the fair? I like it because this is an unplanned answer. I know. I think this is so hard. Also, I have heard you say your story so many times. <laughs> <laughs> Indoctrinated by it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the experience doing the Brooklyn and Chicago fairs has been amazing I think of so many artists that kind of make up those fairs that really took a chance on the fair Mm. and we were from the UK coming over and it was just sort of brand new for everyone and some of those artists now are so passionate about the fair yeah and that's what I find really exciting um so that's not really answering your question but conversely there's all the artists that I suppose they also stick in my mind the artists that come over from England and yeah. have such a fun time at the Brooklyn Fair. Yeah. And we're really connecting artists across the countries. I yeah. mean, no other platform is doing that as no, far as true. I know. And there's so many platforms out there that talk about advice for artists. Yeah. I mean, this podcast, for example, but we're actually giving artists a chance to actually put it into practice. But that's a really interesting point as well. And it's such an overused word nowadays, like this idea of community. It's so easy for anyone to go, oh, we've created this community, because essentially that's what everyone's trying to do now, right? It's like you don't have followers, you don't have customers, you've got a community. Yes. Whereas I think often the definition is wrong, but definitely in this case, I mean, there's such a community base with our artists. Yes, and we're, yeah. And I consider us involved in that as well, in the sense that, we connect so deeply connected to us and everyone involved in the fair. Yes. Oh, I thought of someone. I thought of someone that sticks to my mind is Mark Beatty because he did the fair really early on yeah. and he was at Ambika P3. He had that corner booth with yeah. his work. I think he must have been quite young then. And Mark, I've interviewed him. I feel podcast. like he's really young now. <laughs> so he's probably <laughs> going to listen to this. But then he came over with his pieces, which are not easy to transport. Mm. because They're these big metal sculptures he brought them over to New York in crates and showed at the New York fair. And I remember having this moment with him where we were both thinking, 
what are we both doing here? <laughs> <laughs> he has such an amazing attitude to taking part in the fair. That's yeah. why I think he sticks in my mind because he's such fun and he always gets on so well with all the other artists and just has such a positive approach when he doesn't usually sell that much at the fair because his works are investment pieces yeah. and he's looking to get them placed in sculpture parks and those yeah, sorts yeah, of opportunities yeah. of residencies. So, But there's so many artists. There are there's so many, there's yeah. hundreds of artists. So. Yeah. Who's your favourite guest artist? Because I think you're going to say maybe the same as mine. <laughs> I, loved, I loved working with Mike Perry. Ah, he was really one. fun because yeah. I feel he's such a genuine Brooklyn artist as far as yeah. I can tell. And I remember approaching him about his project, Get Nude, Get Drawn. It was kind of like a novelty project a bit. I mean, they did it in a very serious way, but I thought that it was going to be kind of a fun novelty project yeah. to take off your clothes and get drawn by artists in an art fair. But actually, as soon as I spoke to him about it, it made me realise that the project has... It's really fun, but it also is sort of a challenging, profound experience for people yeah. to participate in. And I was really moved by that. thought it was an amazing project that we could bring to the fair. I yeah. loved Mike's approach to it. He works with great artists. He's an amazingly creative person himself. I just think he's the, the perfect match for the fair. Yeah, I how think about, you're absolutely right. How about you? I mean, it's difficult to say. I think like, definitely a big turning point in the fair was when Tracy Emin showed. Of course, yeah. Suddenly this giant light was shone upon what we were doing. So that was a big one. I did also love the Martin Parr. Oh yes, yeah. Experience, which is great. We basically you could you could come in for a three course meal at the fair. So you sit down. It's a three course meal, and each of the courses looks like one of his artworks up on the wall. So it might be a photograph of a cup of tea, but actually it wasn't tea. It was like your f- first course of soup, but they looked identical, and it was just it was really brilliant. That was a great partnership, and he was launching a book and. And people were so excited to come and meet him, weren't they? Yeah, they, they were calling were. us up in the office saying, what time do I need to be there? Yeah. Like really having a celebrity there. But yeah, he was yeah. so nice and down to us. So nice. <laughs> I've just got so many. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I can't <laughs> overlook the one. I have to tell the story of Scott Campbell. And I often <laughs> congratulate you on this one, Sophie. But I just thought it was such like an interesting and different... Th- I, it really brought out the other of the other art fair. Mm. And whether you're into tattooing or not, it wasn't really about that. It was this idea that it was called Whole Glory. And there's a very famous tattooist in the US called Scott Campbell. Anyway, the idea was there's a hole in the wall and people can just put through their arm through this hole and then get a tattoo from Scott Campbell. But he'd never meet you. He'd never discuss what you want. And his tattoos are quite full on. Mm, You know, they're not like a little stick and poke line here or there. (laughs) I mean, they were like daggers through a skull sort of thing. But I just thought that was just such an interesting and cool project to do. And it was tied into free arts. Yes. Um, so we raised lots of money for the charity there. And I just was amazed by the popularity of it. It was just incredible. And actually what I found specifically interesting about it was that the majority of people that did it had never had a tattoo before. So you've gone from having no tattoos to this real full-on one, which you've had no involvement in what it actually was. But then I guess through speaking to Scott, we sort of like realized that largely a lot of reason why people don't get tattoos is like this idea of, you know, knowing what you want for your first one. Mm -hmm. Right. And so nobody's got the perfect idea. And this liberates you from all that decision making. So suddenly you got your tattoo from this. Anyway, so I I sort of really did love that project as well. And I suppose you think about it as a work of art that you're that's going onto your skin because you're in an art fair environment, whereas usually he'd be maybe in a tattoo parlour or wherever he tattoos. I think that's where my perception of art has changed as well over 10 years. It's like seeing mediums like that and considering him as an artist, not a tattooist. Yes, that was a great project. I also can't believe we got it through legal. <laughs> know, yeah, exactly. I think we didn't tell them. <laughs> we were like, yeah, we're doing this little project. <laughs> well, I think there's so much more we talk about in terms of reminiscing about the fairs. I mean, there's been so many amazing experiences on site. And I know all the artists have so many stories as well. But just to focus it back for these last few moments on practical advice for artists... What would you say to artists that are starting out and considering doing the fair? There's never been a better time, probably in history, to be an artist. On the other side of that comment, there's probably never been so many artists out there. So there's never been more competition. But I think now you have full control of your practice and your art, meaning that 
there isn't just one route for you. So it's not like you finish school, you do what you can, you walk around with your portfolio trying to get into a gallery. And that's a bit of an old fashioned approach. And it, whether gallery signs you or not will define on whether you have a career as an artist. Whereas now with, you know, with social media, with online platforms like Saatchi Art or, you know, many of the others, things like the other art fair basically enable you to sort of be as a practicing artist and you own your practice, which is just great. And also lots of brands now are looking to work with artists. artists. I mean, it's not only brands, it's like interior designers and restaurant groups. And so I think as an artist now, you should be like, you know, I think there's great opportunity. Going back to the fair, if you're at an early stage of your career, then it's a good time to do it. What advice would I give? First of all, you have to put an application in for the fair. But then really just get involved in all these sort of additional stuff that we offer. Mm. So, you know, we do these workshops and every now and again, we'll do a little social. Be part of the artist community. Reach out to another artist yeah. that's done yeah. the fair, somebody that's done it five or six times. Get some advice from them. Don't just take our word for it. You know, go and speak to them. The more you can get involved, the better. Okay, Is great. Is that a good enough answer? Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> I'm sure I've more to say on the subject, but... I know. I was just thinking, there's so much more I want to talk about, like Saatchi Art and repositioning the fair, satellite fair during Freeze Week. But maybe we'll just do a part two. If anyone has any questions they'd like to send into the podcast, then if there's enough, maybe we can get Ryan to do a part two. Yeah, <laughs> love that. We can talk about virtual, we can talk about oh, yeah. virtual editions yeah. and <laughs> our online and all this other stuff. <laughs> Or just come to the fair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> come and meet me at the bar and we'll have a drink and we can talk about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ryan. Cool. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you for tuning in and listening this week. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please do follow, subscribe, rate, review the podcast. I appreciate every single review and rating. And tune in next Friday.